beautiful people, welcome back. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today I'm bringing you Jasmine G. She's a graphic recording artist who I met at Creative Mornings Melbourne. She would attend the events from time to time and do a live drawing on the day. Here's my little secret. So whenever Jasmine is at the event, I will get mesmerized by her work and sometimes I would have forgot to focus on the speaker. <laughs> thankfully, thankfully all the talks are recorded and I could just go back and watch them later on. <laughs> if you are unfamiliar with the graphic recording industry, this will be a great chance for you to know what it is all about. It is so interesting, so fascinating, it is another way of communication. It simplifies messages for greater audience to understand. And it is super creative and challenging at the same time. So if you are someone who is in the creative industry, you are going to love this episode. I know it. And if you are someone who wants to start their own business, you are going to love this episode too. But in all honesty, I feel like no matter where you are at with your life, you are going to love this episode. I would highly encourage you to continue watching because guess what? Jasmine is going to teach you how easy and simple it is to start drawing. And guess what? There's also a giveaway at the end. So continue watching and find out what graphic recording is. Enjoy! Well, I honestly just want to say thank you so much for your time. And thank you for being on here. Thank you for sharing your story. And thank you for helping so many creatives. So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for, for thinking of me. I was delighted to get your message. So it's really nice. Definitely. <laughs> I'm going to tell people how I met you in the intro. So I'm not going to talk about it at the moment. But before you talk about your story, I would love to know how are you feeling today? Yeah, I'm really good, thanks. I've got the chance to do some socializing over the weekend, which, you know, is kind of a new thing <laughs> over the past few months. So that was really nice just to hang out with mates I haven't seen for a long time and feel a bit refreshed. So I'm feeling, feeling good for a Monday. Yes, I love to hear that. You know what? I feel like COVID has made a lot of people to be grateful for all these little things. A hundred percent. I just hope that we can kind of hold on to that feeling as things start to open up again and return to normal, that we can kind of remember this like gratitude that we felt for just being able to like go to your friend's house. There's little things you don't realize how important they are until they're taken away. So Totally. So for those who are listening and watching, please <laughs> do your gratitude journal daily now please um share with people your story because you know you have been doing thinking color how did it start by the way i always find this question difficult because it's not like a straight line you know it's a weird job <laughs> and i almost don't know where to start the story like do i start it from being a kid and just always growing up drawing or do I start from like my first graphic recording job? So for me, it started from a place of um, being really interested in alternate communication methods. So before I was a graphic recorder, I mean, and I always just, just drew, but I worked in disability arts um, and also in music management. So like really different things to what I'm doing right now. But I think it's sort of the disability arts, particularly like I used to run um, a group of young people who put on events buying for young people with disabilities. And in that group that we uh, ran, it had this really diverse range of um, abilities and disabilities in some people who were nonverbal, some people who had it really, really hard to sit and listen for half an hour. Um, so trying to find ways to communicate to this group of really different people and allow them to communicate with each other, I think sort of spurred this interest in how we communicate with each other and how visuals particularly because that became a big part of it how they play a role in our communication so that's sort of where it all started from for me in terms of the first seed of a thought in it and then through the music management side of things 
that was kind of like a toe into the corporate world. You know, we did a lot of corporate events and that sort of thing, just to sort of have an awareness of what was happening in that space, what, you know, around conferences and workshops and stuff. So I feel like those two things kind of came together. Um, and I was working for uh, a woman who ran conferences and stuff just part time, doing some part time design work and stuff for her. Um, and she runs a conference called Creative Innovation. So the very first one of them was in 2010. Um, and I met a guy there who was doing graphic recording and I was like, wow, this looks terrifying. <laughs> but awesome and was sort of really um, of interest to me because of the other things that I've been doing. And um, so I kind of kept that in the back of my mind a little bit. And then an opportunity came up to through this woman who ran this conference um for a client of hers that wanted a graphic recorder and this other guy wasn't available and she was like do you want to give it a go and i was like yeah no, <laughs> okay no. so i just sort of like dove right in there um and i loved it instantly like i i think it's something that was creatively satisfying it was intellectually satisfying it's scary and you get that that satisfaction of doing something that you're scared of and the world not ending. And it, yeah, I loved it pretty much immediately and then was put in touch with um, a company, uh, a, a business unit called The Difference, which is now owned by PwC. Um, they'd just been bought by PwC at that time. And essentially they use graphic recording as part of a wider facilitation process called MG Taylor. So MG Taylor has been around since the 70s. They're, from the States, a couple, Matt and Gail Taylor. Matt was an architect and Gail was a primary school teacher. And sort of taking bits from both of their backgrounds, they developed this methodology, facilitation methodology for rapid problem solving. So as part of that, you've got these teams of sort of probably, I don't know, six to 18 people you might have working on an event as one facilitation team with different roles. So someone is in charge of um, the way knowledge moves in and out of the space. Someone's in charge of how you set the physical space in terms of how you move people around and the experience you want them to have. And someone is in charge of the visuals and graphics. So they do the live graphic recording as well as like theming of the space and all this different stuff. Um, so that's where I kind of started learning, like learning on the job, which is amazing to be able to do. Um, and then quickly realised that while the facilitation methodology is really interesting, the bit that I really loved was doing the live graphic recording. So I started doing more of that um, on my own outside of the, the MG Taylor world. Um, and then it all kind of went from there. But yeah, it was, it was love at first sight, the graphic recording. <laughs> I love it. Like, you're so brave. Wait, by the sound of it, have you always been in the creative industry? Yeah, pretty much. So my first like real job that wasn't at a call centre or a chicken shop or <laughs> um, was was in music management. So while it was in the creative industry, like I started just as the person who answered the phones, but. Um, but interestingly, in the, my first, I think I've been there maybe three months. This is a very small company, but everyone quit. Oh, <laughs> after what? A couple of months. It was, to be honest, like it was a, um, my boss was a notoriously difficult person, as many senior people in the music industry can be, or certainly were at that time. Um, so it wasn't uncommon, I would find, in the next few years for people to suddenly quit that job. Yeah. <laughs> It was, um, I very quickly went from just being the person that answering the phone to doing all of the like artist management and booking and tour management, that sort of stuff for, for this very small company. So yeah, so in the creative industry, but not necessarily a creative role. I was 20 when I started that job and I'd been working uh, at a call center for a market research company. And I don't know if you've ever worked at a call centre, but it is one of the mm. most soul destroying <laughs> jobs, <laughs> particularly doing market research, because you'd be called like cold calling people, asking them to do like 20 minute surveys on white office paper. And it was just the biggest drainer you can possibly <laughs> imagine for me and for the poor person on the other end of the phone. Anyway, so I probably worked there about a year, maybe. This was after I, um, cause I, I went, I started uni after school, but then did a semester and was like, nah, I'm not really into 
to this, went and did the travel thing, came back, did about six weeks of the, of, um, the course that I deferred and realised, no, this is still not for me. So this around this time, I'm just kind of like wandering around. Yeah. <laughs> Looking for, looking for some inspiration, but because that job was so awful, <laughs> um, when I when I left it, um, I was like, the next job that I get, I don't care what it is, I don't care if it's cleaning toilets or answering phones or doing data administration, I at least want to be like in the realm of something I give a shit about. Mm. You know, so at least be in the right industry, whether it's yeah, like cleaning windows, whatever. I just want to want to start with something that I have some investment in. But yeah, so always around the, the creative world, yeah, which is a conscious decision to make. Yes, thank you so, so much for sharing that story because I feel like for those who are listening and watching, sometimes people get, uh, what's the word for it? Because they always look at the people's success and then they don't hear the backstory. And now you're really sharing, you know, what you have been through, you were in the call center yes it was awful but that is something that you needed to do and i'm sure you have learned a thing or two because you said the boss was terrible <laughs> and now you probably learn a few things about how to be an amazing boss I, you know i think about it all the time is that what i really learned at that job is what kind of boss or what kind of leader i don't want to be <laughs> yeah I never want to be. And I think it probably also played a role in me not wanting to have a boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, to, to be in control of, of my own time and um, my own space, my own projects. I think that probably did play a role. You know, I joke that like I've never had a real job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, that was, you know, really my first kind of um, paid job in, in, in an industry that I was... Um, uh, interested in yeah I think yeah. I probably I definitely learned a lot and this is the thing like all of these experiences that you have the shitty jobs the things that don't work um, it all it's all just movement on the pathway to to something better you know it's, it doesn't yeah. really matter what you're doing as long as you keep moving you're continuing to learn what you do and don't want to do and learning what you don't want to do is just as important I think as learning what you do want to do I feel that perhaps you have been in the creative industry, maybe because of your upbringing, because your household is quite artistic, right? Yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah, so my mum was a, a writer and an artist, a beautiful illustrator. My sister still works as a graphic designer. And uh, my dad is an accountant, so he kind of let the team down a little bit there. <laughs> but he's actually also very creative. He's a great photographer in his own right. But um, yeah, we used to joke that whoever got partnered with dad at Pictionary drew the short straw. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was just, it was always a part of um, our house growing up was just do it, you know, making things, drawing things. I remember my mum taking us out in the backyard to paint pictures of our dolls and stuff, you know. It was just p part of what we did as activities when we were kids was always drawing and making stuff. Yeah, I love it so much because I feel like not every household is that artistic. And also because technology sort of is so ingrained in our life now, um, a lot of kids, they don't really have the opportunity to use their hands. Yeah, so, yeah, it's true. Yeah, so how do you think, you know, we can ingrain uh, more creativity in our everyday life now? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think also people sometimes get um, caught up in the idea of creativity being like drawing or painting, but there's so many ways that you can be creative that have nothing to do with being um, artistic. Um, so, you know, be, having creativity and being creative is just about thinking about something differently, you know, looking at something from a different perspective. Um, and the reason I think that um, that artistic pursuits are good ways of doing that is because it just, when you visualise something or, or see the way someone else has visualised something, it gives you that different perspective. You, it's a way of sort of like translating what's in your head to someone else without using words. And I think that that's a really, um, a really creatively inspiring thing to do. 
But yeah, I think it, it, it depends on your on what you like personally as well. You know, like my we grew up drawing and painting. Like my husband's house, they're all musicians, so they just had musical instruments around. So they all it feels so natural to them because it was just there. They could just pick them up and play. And to me, like I, it's so funny. Um, and quite like hypocritical because I'll be like, oh, but everyone can draw, you know, like you just don't be scared of it. Pick up a pen and draw and draw. Oh, but music, no, 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 that's for someone else. <laughs> so I can see my own bias there where Dan, my husband, um, feels that way about music. He's like, oh, it's just, it's easy. You pick it up, you have a go. There's, there's nothing to be afraid of. But we put these um, ideas on these things like music and art, like they're for someone else. You know, like, oh, that's for the artists over there, um, which is just, it's just not true at all. So I think the more we can play with stuff and it doesn't seem so scary and foreign or like it's, it exists just in these little pockets for the artists, you know? Yes, I agree. I feel like that is sort of labeling because, and it also stops people from being curious because if you never try, then you wouldn't know what it's going to do to you. I feel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I love how you just said that because I was talking to my writer friend and she was like, I, I asked her a similar question as well. And she was like, you know, you can mindfully chop your onion. That is creative as well. <laughs> because then you can, you know, chop it in a different way or whatever. I'm just like, I love it. And I, would just, I just kept on laughing because of the idea, how simple it is. It's so true. It's, it's just any, any task, anything that you have to do, just trying to look at it from a different perspective or, you know, drive home in a different direction or whatever, you know, just those little things that deviate from the norm. Um, yeah, love it. Creatively chopping an onion. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, because we're speaking of creativity, how important do you think it is and how did it, I say, help you during your childhood? I mean, I think it's incredibly important um, and we're seeing this more and more in terms of um, the, the skills that people are talking about um, wanting to instill from from school and now that it's not so much a focus on maths and science or whatever, but it's these soft skills of creativity and um, creative thinking, problem solving, all of these sorts of things are actually what employers are looking for uh, moving into the future because young people today it is not going to be the same thing like where you you have a job and you're a something you're a plumber or a artist or whatever and you just are in that job for 20 years young people are going to be moving around not just job titles but industries a lot in their lives and things like technology are changing so quickly um that that ability to be creative to be responsive um, critical thinking, the, these are the most important skills that we can have that are transferable between one job and another. So I think it's um, of utmost importance. And I've really seen it um, in the past few months during COVID, like the ability to, to think outside of the box and be like, okay, well, these, these are my skills. How can I apply these in a virtual world? How can I flip this a little bit or pivot as the word of the moment is? <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, and that having that um, ingrained creativity or not, or not being afraid to give things a go. And in fact, I think that's probably one of the key things for me has been when you, when you create a, a habit of creativity or a habit of giving things a go, it becomes so much less scary. And the more you fail, almost, <laughs> The, the easier it gets because you realize, okay, well, the world can come crashing down. Um, it's not really, you know, and also like no one else cares. <laughs> You've got this like, <laughs> like oh, I'm going to try this thing and it's not going to work. And then everyone's going to think I'm awful. No one gives a shit about you. Really. <laughs> like, no one's there concentrating so that hard because you ran an art class and no one came. Like no one cares. But I think that having a sort of uh, a, a practice of, of giving it a go um, has been, incredibly valuable to me and I think that's part of that creativity growing up for sure yes yes I love it and I love the way that you said it because I just really think that people need to live outside their bubble sometimes and you know honestly people really don't care what you're doing or if you fail and 
also when you think that you fail in other people's eyes maybe you are succeeding so yeah. <laughs> the perspective really you know need to change a little bit so thank you so much for sharing that um let's talk about your business think mm-hmm. in color what has been the uh hardest challenges in the first five years yeah i was just thinking about this this morning i think um probably to begin with uh, a couple of things one was when i first started i was still working part-time um and knowing that i had to kind of take that leap from keeping one like my little safety net there to move to just running my business and knowing that i would be losing a bit of money and um but having the courage i guess to take that leap was was really hard um but but also acknowledging like i knew that i had to do it and that i wouldn't be able to really explore the full potential of it until i did that but that was definitely a difficult decision to make and and scary and you know you're you're all on your own out there and um that was def- definitely the first point that was difficult and the other thing that i found really hard in the first couple of years which i know is the experience of a lot of people working in creative industries is that i found it really difficult to talk about money i found like quoting clients really like nerve-wracking and awkward i just because I, i had no experience of it really that i just I really found it difficult to to value myself appropriately um, and have the confidence in talking to clients about that, which did develop. I have no problem with it now, but you know, it took a long time to to really develop that confidence. And I know that that's um, that's really common for people who are working as you know illustrators, artists, musicians to value yourself properly in that way can be really tricky and i guess those sort of general business skills that you don't i haven't done a course in this or anything so it's like you know working that stuff out as you go the administration of it (laughs) yes yeah i love the points that you share i just want to say thank you for being brave and stepping out of that comfort zone that you had because you honestly have helped so many people so thank you so much and For those who are listening and watching, please, you know, she's right. Like you sometimes just got to be brave and courageous and be in the discomfort. Is there a dog behind you? Oh, yes. Come here, Chi-Chi. Chi-Chi? <laughs> so, <clears throat> this is the light of my life, Chi-Chi the Chihuahua. <laughs> hey, Chi-Chi! <laughs> and she's been the real winner out of lockdown because she just gets cuddles like 24/7. Yes. I bet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow, well, thank you. Uh, nice meeting you, Chi Chi. <laughs> and the second the second point that you mentioned, what was it? Uh the quoting thing. Yeah. Thank you very mm-hmm. much for quoting that. Will you add um Emily Cohen's talk? Yes. Oh, yes. how good was it? Yeah, fabulous. I, yes, I honestly feel like whatever she has mentioned is so true. Like you when you are trying to prize yourself, it's the love that you are putting in to your own work. And I feel like that is not just in creative industry. Like I feel like a lot of industries as well. Like for example, when someone mm-hmm. they want to ask for a pay rise, they then undervalue themselves as well and so there are so honestly thank you so much for bringing those two points up <laughs> um but you know what everyone dream to be an entrepreneur or being a freelancer and you know what you have really portray the whole story of being a entrepreneur and how much work it goes behind it and time and etc but people only look at the beautiful side. So for those who want to own their own business, what would be the top three thing that you want to say to them before they cash out all their savings? <laughs> um, yeah, a few things. Well, I think first is the the point that I have already made around like t- taking that leap and being all in. I think you really have to be prepared to be 100% in it whether that whether it works or not if you don't um 
don't put 100% of your energy into that thing, you, you're never going to be able to see how far you can really go with it. So that would be the one thing, be, be prepared to be all in. Uh, the, the other thing I think, you know, we people used to talk a lot about this idea of work-life balance but I think it's probably more like particularly if you're working for yourself a work-life blend you know so I don't really think of because I, I mean I'm very lucky in that I really enjoy my work but um, it's it's part of my my work is part of my life and my life is part of my work I don't see them as hugely separate things um, and as long as you take enough time to rest and look after yourself and all these sorts of things, I actually don't think that's a bad thing. And I almost think you need to have a little bit of that if you're in something for you yourself. Like you have to be prepared for it to be a big part of your life and, um, and potentially a big part of your identity as well. Um, uh, and then f and finding the right balance of things that works for you. Like I've experimented with different, like being in a, um, co-working space, having a studio outside of home. Now I've got my studio in my house, which I love, but I think I couldn't have done that when I started out. I needed the structure of going to a place and like putting my work clothes on and, you know, feeling like I was going to a proper job to be able to, um, I think convince myself that it was real. You know? Yeah. <laughs> They're like, yeah, no, you do have a job. You're doing it. You're doing work. <laughs> but I think, yeah. you know, after some years, I found I didn't really need that anymore. Um, and I would prefer to to save on the extra rent and the travel time and work from home, which I now love. But yeah, I think it's finding that right that right blend of things. The other thing I think that's been a big game changer for me in the last probably a few years into running a business um, is about delegating some parts of the job. If you can, you know, if you're able to have, I've got a virtual assistant, Chloe, who I've been working with for maybe like seven, seven or eight years, like quite a long time from a couple oh. of years. She's fabulous and um, just like takes that admin stuff that not only do I not like doing, but I'm just not very good at, you know, like it's <laughs> much better for someone who is really good at that stuff like Chloe, who's hyper organized and on top of things. Like if you can chunk off these bits of things that you don't like and or you're not good at, get an accountant, don't do your own tax if you don't have to. <laughs> yes, you'll be spending a little bit extra in dollars, but the amount that you save in time and just emotional energy is so 100% worth it, you know, and it might take a little while to build your business enough so that you've got a little bit of extra money to do those things. But I found that, um, not only was I much happier once I got some people to to do some of the bits of the business that I didn't enjoy doing so much, but actually my business became much more successful because I could take on more of the work that I enjoy. Um, so the turnover ended up being higher as a result of that too. So yeah, I think identify the bits that, you're, that aren't your thing, find people whose thing it is and let them do their jobs. <laughs> yes, I love them. And you know what? The first point that you point out, the give you be prepared to give a hundred percent. That reminded me of the talk that I had with um, this guy. His name is Max Burton. Mm -hmm. So he, him, and I would talk about you know putting a hundred and ten percent effort and etc. It's not just your business, also you know the relationships that you have with your friends and family and etc. But if you don't want to put in a hundred percent then don't expect that you are gonna get anything back <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah and then the other point that you just said the virtual assistant thing actually can you please tell me like what exactly does she help you do yeah sure so um she does all of the like logistic stuff when it comes to my client management so so say we get a new client um uh who sends an inquiry from the website so I'll be the first first person to feel that because there's a lot of like weird specifics of, of our job. And for a lot of people, it's still, if you're hiring a graphic recorder, it's often the first time they've used it. It's still a new thing for a lot of people. So I find it's important for me to always have the initial conversation with the client so I can get to know them a little bit and what they need and blah, blah, blah. Then Chloe will take over that booking at the point where it's confirmed. So I'll have an initial chat with the client. They'll be like, great, cool. We'll go ahead with this conference for these dates. And that's when Chloe will come in. So she's got like a standard um, logistics email that she'll send to the client, um, which will be stuff. Okay, so now in COVID, 
good world, it's all pretty straightforward because we don't need details about venue or parking or any of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's part of what she would historically do. She'd send them an email um, confirming venue, arrival time, contact on the day, all of that stuff. Um, she collects that information and follows it up and she'll pop that into our calendar so then when I go to a, an event, it's all there, which is fantastic. It just saves so much time in me following things back and forth. Um, so she does that. She also does all of the invoicing and the following up of invoices. Um, she'll do other administrative things like um, new supplier forms, that kind of a thing. Um, she's, yeah, so I'll send her our bank statements and she can follow if things being paid or not um, and generally just like keep me in check <laughs> and yeah. the admin stuff that I'm not doing. So, yeah, and then there might be like... Um, Things like updating our database that'll come up every now and then. She'll um, input uh, receipts for things that we bought into MYOB. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love it. You know what? It makes me want to interview a VA. And also, I just want to mention how time is money. So your time is money. You should see your time as a currency. So like you said, like, you know what? Someone is super great at doing organizing stuff or doing video, whatever it is, then let them do it because that's their passion. And yeah. like you said, you know, do whatever you are passionate about. <laughs> 100%. I couldn't agree more. And that's it. And there are these things that like, like take the accounting side of things, for example, it's something that I could do but it's going to take me three times as long i'm going to have to look up how to do stuff because i don't know how to do it it's going to cost me in time but also just in frustration and then i won't want to go and do the other thing that i was meant to do that day because i'm like oh, i've earned a coffee i'm going to go and get myself a muffin <laughs> you know? so i think that as much as you can get rid of those extra uh hours and extra stresses if you can if you're able to do it i think it's just um game changing yeah, I love it. Well, I am sure that you still have bad days too. We're only human. <laughs> sure, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you look after your mind, body and soul? Yeah, good question. Well, I go to the gym a lot. I go to our local CrossFit gym, which is a combination of uh, weightlifting, gymnastics and um, body weight strength and cardio. So um, I, I train six days a week. I train first thing in the morning uh, and for me um, having that routine is really important so that's probably that's like the one thing that I do that's the same every day so usually when when we're not in lockdown times um, my weeks can look really different week to week I might have a week where I'm interstate for work I might have a week where I've got two days of a conference and three days at the studio. I might be working from the studio for two weeks in a row. Yeah, it's really sort of um, up and down, which I also really enjoy because working from home, it's nice to have that balance of going somewhere and doing my job, which I've really been missing actually in the last little while mm. and being from home. But um, but yeah, so in a in a job where that, that can be kind of all over the place having that routine I find really really great for my mental health um and also just and doing the physical exercise obviously is is great too so um yeah. yeah and then seeing seeing people like making sure you catch up with the people that you love really important <laughs> I love it I think um physical movement is definitely super important and you, you know what, you don't have to go to the gym. You can just, you know, be at home and do some sit-ups or whatever. Like, and honestly, routine, yes, routine is so important. Because of COVID, your gym would have been closed. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the gym's closed, but the small there's a small group of us who have just been going to our mate's place who's got a tennis court behind his house. Ooh. So... Once we were allowed to have 10 people, we've been getting together at the Oval or the tennis court behind his house in the mornings and keeping it up. Before that, um, and it's been, I mean, talk about creativity. I've been so amazed by the response of, of all of these different industries, how quickly people were able to get together a new offering that was virtual and online. Like our gym 
within the week of having to close down because it was quite like, I mean, we were there on the Monday or whatever it was. And by the Tuesday it was closed. Like it was really immediate. Um, but they, they, so they continue to do programming, but they've just adjusted it all so that it's stuff you can do from home. So you can still follow along the program at home. Um, then they've also been doing like zoom workouts, um, um, on a Saturday morning that everyone can tune into, but then they have something on every day. So whether at six o'clock, there might be like a Zoom um, mobility session where you do stretches all day, like a body weight strength thing, or just like a talk talking about mindset or nutrition or whatever. So they, they just did this incredible job of um, finding a way to continue right. to to serve their community um, and also still exist as a business. So they um, reduced the uh, membership rate so you could have this online membership for the time that they've been there. So it's, it's definitely been a, um, a test of our self-motivation because <laughs> part of the reason we go there is because we are motivated by doing it with other people, right? Otherwise we wouldn't pay for the gym membership when we just do yeah. it at home. So um, it's interesting to be reminded how important those connections are and that even doing these, you know, um, little sessions via Zoom in the evenings, just seeing everyone's faces and feeling part of a community, feeling sort of like uh, accountable as well. Like, in the, yeah. And just feeling like, yeah, it's like there's part like, of the thing, thing. Part of the thing and yeah. um, if, if, you do, if you miss the workout that day, you know, and you feel like everyone else is out there doing it, you know, so you don't want to miss out. You don't want to let the team down, even though it's, you know, it doesn't really matter. But <laughs> I just want to say what you have mentioned is amazing about how quickly the gyms get together and do the online virtual stuff because it really shows how important it is to be um resilient and to adjust to change. Otherwise, honestly, you're going to fall behind. So thank you to all those gyms that went online and kept open and helped their memberships. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's amazing, and that um, I think we've we've all learned a lot of lessons in the past few months about flexibility and resilience, and and not holding on to the idea of what your job is too tightly. You know, having a little bit of a loose grip on things. So when something like this happens, which no one ever could have predicted at the end of last year that this was going to happen, right? But it's been a, um, a really great reminder to to be prepared to flex when you need to and that it's, it's fine to give something different a go whether it works or not. Totally. Well, what are, what are, you, what are you doing when you're not like coaching or drawing or working? Other than working out. <laughs> kind of all I do really um that and and eating and drinking wine they're probably like behind yeah. <laughs> the main thing on the list yeah uh what else is there yeah I mean I, I really like going um getting out into the bush and going for hikes and stuff which is um it's really good particularly at the moment to get out and you know be in the great outdoors um you met little Chi Chi before, hanging out with her, <laughs> taking her to the beach. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I like it. Nice and relaxing. Speaking of wine, what is your favorite wine? Ooh, I, you know, I used to be a, a white, a white girl, mm -hmm. um, uh, like a Pinot Grigio, that kind of vibe, but I'm getting more into reds as I uh, get older. So like a nice Shiraz is nice at the moment in this weather. Um, yeah. I'm also partial to a rosé as well in the summer. Look, I don't is mind. It... <laughs> <laughs> Just any wine, I'm buying. <laughs> so funny. Well, um, we I feel like we didn't really tell people what people can expect from thinking colour. So would you like to tell people what they can expect or if there's anything new that's coming? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially Thinking Colour is a visual communications organisation. So we specialise in translating complex ideas into visuals and um, we do that in, in three ways. One is through graphic recording, which is the live illustration of content in real time. So 
usually that's at uh, events and workshops and conferences. Obviously, not a whole lot of those happening at the moment. Um, <laughs> what I have been doing in the last few months uh, is doing that in the virtual space. So whether you've got online workshops that are on Zoom or webinars, uh, it works exactly in the same way, uh, except it's obviously digital and, and virtual. So uh, I'll be live drawing on my iPad connected into the Zoom call or the webinar or wherever and people can, can watch that happening in real time like you would in a in a in-person conference. And I, I sort of had this sneaking suspicion when um, COVID hit and all of these things were trying to move into the virtual space that graphic recording might even be more valuable in this space and, and now I'm, I'm convinced of it actually that it is because we're spending our whole days like this in Zoom meetings looking at people's faces and, and to have something that's just a little bit different like we were talking about earlier just like offering a different perspective um, is so valuable and also just something that's engaging and providing those visual anchors in the virtual spaces has been so useful to people so we've had awesome feedback um, from people we've been doing virtual events with which is great so that's the probably the newest one is the virtual graphic recording yeah. um, we also do videos uh, so hand-drawn videos um, and and other illustrations and infographics. So it's it's all all the same kind of idea, which is this idea of translating written or verbal content into um, into visuals. So whether that's live in the room at a workshop or whether that's from a brief um, to create a video or an illustration, it's the same same kind of vibe. I will also teach. Um, so teach sort of graphic recording 101. Um, uh, so I. In the past done these as two-day courses um, we now have an online course up and running which is really exciting so this is not just for people who think they might like a career in graphic recording it's also um, we've had a lot of people come through who are facilitators or teachers um, where you think you could get some value out of um, out of visual communication which might be for yourself and your own note-taking it might be for the front of room um, We've had a lot of consultants do it as well. They find it's a really um, useful like tool to have in your tool belt when you're working with clients to try and, you know, nut out a problem. Um, so, yeah, so I'll make sure I get the, the links to the online course to you. But I'm also going to be running a virtual uh, workshop in the next couple of months sometime. So um, that will be the same content as the online course, but we'll do it together uh, virtually as opposed to how we used to do it with a two-day course. Yes, I love it. Thank you for um, saying that you teach as well, because I actually want to, I actually would love you to sh teach the viewers and the listeners that, you know, it is quite simple to start with their creativity, because I truly believe that creativity is ingrained in us. It just, some people are more exposed to it. And yeah. So would you like to teach? How sure. simple it is? Yeah, what I'll do is I'm just going to pop my, um, my camera onto my iPad. Yep. So one of the um, things I think, you know, and you're so, you're so right in saying that um, creativity is in us and that, like I was saying earlier, we sort of think that it's like just for artists or people who can draw and we get, conf we sort of have this, um, this confused message that, um, that it's like magic somehow, like being able to draw is something that you do or you don't have. But mm. in like any other skill, it's just practice over time. And so yeah. you can learn it just like how you can learn to play the trumpet, just like how you can learn to do a tax return. Wishing isn't going to get you very far. Yeah. But you, can, you can practice. So um, here's my, my biggest tip when it comes to simple drawing is that yeah. everything is made out of shapes. So the yep. best thing you can do is try and identify the shapes that something is made up of. And that's a really good way to, to break it down, to be able to know how to draw it, but also remember how to draw it. So a lot of the time it's just uh, a memory exercise, but breaking it down into the shapes can, can be a good way of, of, um, of remembering what a thing looks like. So say if you've got a, a bus. A bus is essentially a rectangle. And then it's got a couple of circles.
and some lines. Right? See, and that's not a perfect, like, beautiful drawing, but you can tell that that's a bust, right? Yes. Yeah. And then if you think of something like a chicken, it's mm -hmm. kind of like a uh, semicircle. I love it. Um, or a a cow is actually also square. You might think of a cow being sort of more rounded, but a cow is actually really square, and it's got a squarish kind of head. <laughs> So cute! You know, so these things, they don't have to be um, really detailed to get the point across. So you're just looking at what, yes. what shape is something made up of and what are its distinguishing features, you know. So for a cow, having the, you know, horns and ears or spots help us recognise that it's a cow. Um, so it's it's really not that um, not that scary. <laughs> I try way yeah, just yeah breaking it into shapes and um, and keeping it as simple for yourself as possible is a really interesting thing moving into graphic recording from being someone who always drew you have to let go of a lot because you're doing stuff in real time it's really really fast it doesn't matter if it's a perfect bus or a perfect cow what matters is that people understand that that's what it is so um, it was actually quite liberating, like letting go of a lot of this perfectionism that can come when you're creating your own art, when you're using it as a communication tool. Like, yes, it's important for it to, to look good um, enough to be understood, but it doesn't have to be perfect. It's, a, it's as much about the process as it is about the product. And this is the really interesting thing about graphic recording is that it's both a, pro a facilitation process tool that helps people stay engaged, it helps provide these visual anchors, that helps with your memory retention. And then it's also a product. So you get the thing that you can use as a communication tool. It connects you back in with the memories of being there if you're seeing it happening live. Um, you know what? I, you brought up a really good point about perfectionists. People get paralyzed uh, wanting to be perfect. But I just really want to share with everyone that's listening and watching that perfect is a standard that you are, I don't know, sort of limiting yourself. Because if you want to be perfect to whatever the state that you think it's perfect, then you will keep on postponing whatever you want to do. And you know what, like you said, like, People just need to understand what the message is. It is. So, <laughs> and also, yeah. you will keep on continue to improve yourself. So don't, yes, strive for perfect, but always give it a try. And thank you so much for sharing how easy it is. My pleasure. Yeah, and look, you, I 100% um, agree. There's a great uh, idiom that is used a lot in the facilitation circles that we work in, which is don't let perfect get in the way of progress. Yes. Is a great mantra. yes, thank you so much for sharing that. And well, before I ask you my last question, do you feel like there's anything that we didn't talk about or you would like to say? No, I feel like I've talked a lot. <laughs> More than enough. Nothing pops to mind, I guess that, um, Definitely my, my biggest learning in the 10 years of running this business or the um, thing that's made the biggest difference to me is this idea of just like, just say yes, just give it a go. Like that first graphic recording job that came um, into my path, I had no experience and I easily, and I was, I was terrified, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Just because you do it doesn't mean that like it's, it's a pleasant experience necessarily doing the scary thing. But um, this has been a, a, a constant sort of theme is this idea of like, say, say yes and work it out later. Like when we first started doing videos um, and Dan does the video production for us, it came from people continuously asking when I was doing graphic recording work, do you guys do videos? Because they'd seen that style of hand-drawn videos. So eventually I just said yes and was like, all right, Dan, 
we got to work out how to do videos. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just the saying yes, saying yes and working it out later um, has been a big part of my journey. Yeah. I love it. Have you seen the Yes Man? It's a movie. No, no, I haven't. Oh, I, I think you might like it. So for those who are watching okay. and listening, I would also highly recommend you to watch that movie. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Put it on um, the list. Now, my last question for you is, how do you think we can help each other in general right now? Yeah, this is such a lovely question. And I was um, been thinking about it over the last couple of days. Uh, and I'm going to go something that's relatively simple, I think, is that I think we can really help each other by bringing our whole self into our work, into the conversations that we have, of coming with your own style, speaking with your normal voice, um, you know, letting your dog come into the background of your video. And I feel like this is something that has really started happening in the last few months because we're all inside each other's homes, right? There's no, like, pretense of, like, we put the suit on and go to the place. Like we're seeing the messy bits. We're seeing people's <laughs> toddlers and dogs and I've got my tracksuit pants on <laughs> underneath here. <laughs> you know? But um, I feel like it, you can almost feel this collective exhale when you come into a room and you, you talk about, I don't know, spilling your drink on your your coffee on your top on the way in and having to just those little like messy life things when someone brings that into the workspace it just gives everyone else permission to be their whole Please. selves too um and and people love it like it's it just makes our whole existence and talking about this like work life blend thing it just makes everything so much more relaxed and pleasant if we can all just be our entire normal selves <laughs> wherever we go. Yes, yes, I love it. Thank you so much for bringing up that point because you know what? At the end of the day, we are all humans. You can't just yeah. keep on putting up that whatever you think other people want to see or pretending just too much. Relax, man. Yeah, that's right and it's funny like when I first because working in the corporate space is obviously you know a, a bit different for um for someone who was like painting portraits at markets before that but <laughs> um I had this real idea in my head that I had to like wear a suit and um be very like corporate-y but forgetting that they, people have hired me as an artist, you know, they've hired me as an illustrator and they've hired me for my skills in listening and synthesizing and, and drawing and all of that sort of stuff. That actually, they're almost let down if you're not there in your normal creativeness with your um, your whole creative spirit and creative style. Um, and once I realized that, it was actually incredibly liberating for me and everything just became so much easier because I wasn't worried about like, I'm going to get found out. They're going to realize that I'm not like them. But also then I realized that there's no, there is no them. Like there is no like these people are like this and these people are like this. There's plenty of creative people within corporations. There's plenty of corporate minded people who are artists and it's not this black and white thing where all shades of, of, of all different colors, <laughs> yes. um, you know? Yeah. Thank you so much for being so real with me. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Hello, my beautiful people. Did you enjoy the interview? Will you start drawing now? If you do, please do share them with me and Jasmine. We would love to see your progress. I really, really love the last point that she pointed out, which is to bring your whole self to everything. It's such a great point because honestly, who are you pretending to be? The more you pretend to be someone else, the less you are connected with the true self. Give yourself a permission to be who you really are. Not what your parents want you to be, not what your friends or what the society wants you to be. Be who you are. And please, be accepting of how other people are as well. Because you know what? We're all different, remember? I really, really enjoyed the interview. 
Now, as I mentioned, there's a giveaway that Jasmine would love to give to you. She would love to give five people of her first book, which is GR's Best May. Stands for Graphic Recordings Best May. It's a pocket book where you can put it in your back pocket, put it in your bag. It has all the secret weapons about graphic recording. You are going to love it. If you are someone who is studying graphic design, you're gonna want to enter. If you are someone who is in the creative industry, you're gonna want to enter. If you're someone who is aspiring to do graphic recording, you are definitely gonna want to enter. All the terms and conditions are gonna be in the description below. Now don't forget to subscribe to this channel, click the thumbs up button if you have loved it, share it with someone because you never know what they're going through. And please go give Jasmine some love. Her details are also in the description below. Now, if you are someone who wants to stop pretending and really let your true self shine, check out the self-development stuff that I've been sharing. And remember, you're amazing and you're not alone. I will see you in the next video.